She went under the wheels. Oh, perfected. Welcome to Under the Wheels. I'm Matthew. And I'm Gabe. And in today's episode, we have all the time in the world to discuss No Time to Die. <laughs> How did you like that one for an opener? It wasn't bad. I mean, this is... Uh... I think this, this Bond movie is probably the most aware of its title ever. <laughs> Um, it's weird because most Bond movie titles are, they're either just like the villain's name, you know, it's the Dr. No, because Dr. No's the bad guy. Right. Or it's like a location, Casino Royale, it takes place at the Casino Royale in Montenegro. <laughs> yeah. Well, they- but the, a lot of the rest are just like, like very loosely related to what's going on, if anything, or it's just pure nonsense, like a view to a kill. It's just right. Like, well, aside from, from Russia with Love, which is probably the most on the point uh, James Bond title. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, no, um, this is the, only the second Bond film that does that has an original title. I think the first one is like Die Another Day, something like that. That's not a reference to another Ian Fleming thing. Yeah, well, yeah, because I was going to say, wait, isn't Skyfall for an original Sk- title? Um, it's I th- because it references his home that he grew up in. But is that even taken... part of the, like, original lore? Because I always thought that was just, like, fan fiction. Um, well, I know that after Sean Connery was Bond and it brought, like, a bunch of acclaim, Ian Fleming went back and added, like, a Scottish background to Bond. Oh. So I would not be surprised if that if like the place he grew up was called Skyfall. Let's check here. James Bond character. As, I'm just I'm referring to anything that's in the original books as as lore or lore official or canon, and then anything right. that's in the movies is fan fiction, or anything that's just in the movies but not in the books is fan fiction. Right. Yes. Um, even though he's been passed off to many other people, and it continues. Let me see here. Um, yeah, even though like the movies are their own official thing and have their own uh, lore, I guess. Well, especially like the especially Daniel now. Craig movies. Jesus Christ. I know. Oh, my God. Uh, let me see. Uh, let's see. Bond loses his virginity at the age of 16, which is later reminisced in From a View to a Kill. Um, uh, That's something I needed to know. Spends much of his... Uh, the novel is son of a Scottish father, Andrew Bond of Glencoe, and a Swiss mother, Monique Delacroix of Canton Devoud. Um, the young mm. Bond spends much of his early life abroad, becoming multilingual in German and French because of his father's work as a vicar's. Um, parents were killed in a mountain climbing accident. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know where they got the name Skyfall from. I think they made it up. Let me see here. Skyfall based on let's see. Place where it seems so close to the sky. No. Let's see. Just uh, concede is... that I'm right so we can move on. Let, let's just move on anyway. If it turns <laughs> out that uh, that I'm right, I'll, I'll put in an addendum. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's see. It's Skyfall. All right. So anyway, yeah. Um, barring Skyfall, it's the only because even Quantum of Solace, there was a, Is, short, yeah, story a short story called Quantum of, Sol- which the short story Quantum of Solace has nothing to do with the movie Quantum of Solace. Correct. So yeah, that's you know, which is weird because I think like our generation, um, got used to the word die being in or like die or kill being in James Bond titles because. Like all of the Pierce Brosnan movies, well, most of them had some had like an abstract title that would reference it. At least two of the four did. Well, it's and like then, Die Another Day, You Only Live oh, Twice, um, License to Kill, License to Kill, Tomorrow I mean, Never Dies. <laughs> like, yeah, no, yeah. it's yeah. But I think of all the James Bond titles, No Time to Die is the most James Bond D title ever. Right. Which I've mentioned before. But it's yes. just like 
I don't know if you were like if an AI like if you threw all the James Bond movie titles into a like some kind of AI random number generator thing and just told it to spit out a James Bond title, it would just be like beep boop, no time to die. Mm -hmm. Which is funny because like they were having such a hard time coming up with a name for this thing. Like for the longest time, it was just called Bond Twenty Five. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm kind of surprised they didn't call it James Bond Endgame. <laughs> or James Bond Rises. James Bond Infinity War. Because that's basically what they did in this movie. <laughs> I, Oh my god, this movie. All right. Um, let's start talking about it. Um, you, we're also like, I feel like we're different than every other show because I just want to get it out of the way first and I always want to know what your rating is and then we get into discussion. Probably not great because then if someone doesn't like your rating, instead of like teasing them, they just get it outright and then they don't they don't bother to listen to your justification. But I, I don't yeah. care. I have to listen to it. So um, what do you give James Bond 007 in Ian Fl or Daniel Craig as Ian Fleming's James Bond, Agent 007, in no time to die it's a witness maybe even a high witness i had a feeling you'd go there i think i overgraded it i give it a low shiny in chrome um <laughs> i and really my only because i had it i from from the word go i just really liked the movie on reflection there's a lot of things that are kind of questionable about it but um and yeah, I'm, I'm I was going to sure say, we'll from the word that. go, I really wanted to like the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there was, uh, there was an element of that in, in me that like, I really wanted to like it. And I got lucky in that enough of it kind of fell into place where I wanted it. Um, so I did like it. But yeah, there are, there are some problems with it. But I'm still going to go with a low shiny. Like, I really, really enjoyed it to the point like I... In my sickened state, I wanted to like find a way to smuggle myself into a theater to to watch it again for three hours and increase my fever dreams. I mean, that's part of the problem is it's three fucking hours long, man. One of like, my friends posted no time to pee. I was like, yeah, dude, you know it. Oh, it's just, I mean, we'll get right into it. It's way too long. It didn't mm -hmm. need to do this. It, it yeah. doesn't have to be Avengers Endgame no. where you wrap up every loose end plot thread from the you know Daniel Craig Bond saga that is four movies long. It's yeah. like, I don't know. It so just makes me, no fucking sense. Like, to me, we made a lot of parallels to like Batman Begins and Casino Royale and like going through that. Like Casino Royale, Batman Begins, they're like, they're equivalent. Dark Knight and Skyfall to a lesser extent equivalent. I mean, no I would say I, I always Knight equate rises. the end of Skyfall to Batman, <laughs> to Begins, Batman Begins because it's beat yeah. for beat Batman Begins. <laughs> but but the ending, but like No Time to Die is like I was watching it and I was like, I'm getting so many shades of the Dark Knight Rises here, like <laughs> leading up to the ending. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? At least at least the Dark Knight Rises ended on like a very, very sweet and bittersweet ending. This one, I was just like, mm -mm, I ain't feeling it. That's the only thing I didn't like about the movie, too. Really? But, uh, yeah. Oh, I, I thought hate, there was I, much more not to like. <clears throat> um, in hindsight, there is, but at the time, I, I, like I cover some of the stuff that really bugged me in my review of it. But yeah. at the time, the the thing that really like th the high I was feeling enjoying the movie was completely dampened by the ending. So I think the movie's principal problem is that it's three hours long. And that if it wasn't three hours long, most of its other issues would also not be there. I mean, the big issue is that, you know, like Avengers Endgame is the conclusion to 10 years of movies where it's like they put out one or two movies every year. So it's like 20 movies worth of story all coming together for one big, you know, TV show style finale. Right. Um James Daniel Craig's James Bond has four movies, and only one of them is really good. <laughs> Dang, I would say two of them are, but okay, one and a half of them are really good. So there's not a whole lot to work with, and there's not a whole lot I want to remember or see tied together. So then this movie comes along and says, "What if we spend 
like an hour and 45 minutes tying together all the things that you didn't care about from the last couple movies and then for the last hour it'll be its own movie and it's like that's terrible why would you do that (laughs) yeah like i okay specter i didn't hate it as much as a lot of people hated it i thought it was fine i i kind of like specter so the only one I, I really don't like, and I watched it again recently, was Quantum of Solace. But I actually, I either like or really, really like all of Daniel Craig's Bond movies, obviously, because I gave this one such a high rating. Yeah. Oh, I'd say Casino Royale is the best Bond movie of all time. Quantum of Solace is a giant steaming pile of shit. Uh, <laughs> Skyfall <clears throat> is also really excellent until they go to bond manor and ra's al ghul burns it down and they have to escape through uh, the underground dumbwaiter and alfred and it becomes a home alone movie it becomes batman begins <laughs> i still don't see it i see i see the i see the home alone comparison and i love uh kincaid he's the best grumpy old albert finney like hate, hitting on like, M. Oh the, my god, I love oh, it. It's so creepy. Of, it's so funny. The last sequence of Skyfall is trash, in my opinion. The um, only it just, it thing ruined that, the movie for me. The only thing um, that could have made that better is if James Bond took the knife and killed uh, Javier Bardem, Spartan style, where he sticks the knife into his throat and rips it out. Like I would have been like, fuck yeah. The only yeah, thing no, that could have made it more like Batman Begins is if he killed Javier Bardem on the ice. And said, no. you should mind your surroundings. <laughs> <laughs> no, suddenly they board a train somewhere. And all of a sudden it's like, where did this train come from? Don't you know, just ignore it. And, and then that train blows up and goes into a cave in Scotland and becomes Sean Connery. But yeah, it's like that entire ending didn't. I mean, it, it completely turned me off the movie. Um, yeah. Spectre was fine. It's entertaining enough, even though it's utterly pointless and kind of ruins retroactively all the other movies. Yeah. Um, by making a like, okay. It's like Blofeld is secretly, uh, Oh God. Yes. We, J- yeah. James Bond's adoptive brother, which is <laughs> idiotic. Number one, <laughs> number two, everything that's ever happened in the last, uh, three movies. It was me, James. I'm the author of all your pain. Like that's dumb as fuck. <laughs> So, awesome. like, like on its surface, Spectre is fine. Like, it's not that bad. It's just everything having to do with Blofeld and Spectre stinks. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, No Time to Die comes along. And it's like, hey, remember Spectre? Remember Blofeld? Remember Casino Royale, which somehow was, like, 20 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> look at Daniel Craig. Doesn't he look like a suitcase? Um <laughs> <laughs> it's like remember yeah. this remember this remember this it's like i don't want to remember this i just want to watch a fucking spy movie man it's funny that the only like the best james bond movies are the ones that could almost be standalones um but anyway go, go well on. yes that go that on. that is entirely the point i'm trying to make the yes. best bond movies stand by themselves then like just don't tie into anything And because James Bond generally, like, each story stands on its own. A lot of the old ones were very, like, loosely connected where, like, you know, Spectre would pop up here and there or, like, be secretly behind whatever was going on. But there's no real continuous story. Yeah. Um, And that's why, like, I don't know. like, Like, I saw No Time to Die with My Girlfriend, and this was her first ever Bond movie. Oh. Oh, God. Yeah. And she's How like, she if, like she should have been on this episode because we need we need someone who isn't associated with the series at all. I know she said it's too long. It's like it's too long. I don't have any attachment to anything that's going on. Like the action's cool, um, and it's like you know exciting or whatever. But it's like the finale of this TV show that I have no context for. Yeah. Um, and. See, that's my problem. It's like, you should be able to watch this movie with no con. Like, you should be able to watch any James Bond movie with no context for the entire series and still enjoy it and understand everything that's happening. You know what I mean? You shouldn't be like, wait, who's this 100%. guy? What movie was he from? Who's this person? That's a bigger problem, though, in, in all of our media today. Um, 
but yeah, it's specifically a problem here. Like I have, I wrote down a note here, loose serialization, um, as a concept. It yeah. basically, that's, that's how Bond works best. And they were so obsessed with trying to make these movies connect for no reason. Like once they started making the movies connect, that's what, cause Casino Royale almost feels like a slight variation on the normal Bond, like the normal Bond stuff. And that's, well, that's it, fine. It, Casino Royale is just another Bond movie done yes. really, really well. Right. They cha- I mean, they changed some of the, like, they removed some elements, you know, but, like, it could have been a standalone. Because I just, I rewatched Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace. And Quantum of Solace <laughs> is where all of the bad stuff on this series kind of floated to the surface. And for some reason, Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson just wanted to keep that thing going, like, No one asked. The reason Skyfall was good was because, like, between Quantum of Solace and Skyfall, like, in Quantum of Solace, we're like, Bond, you're you're too young. You're so loose. And then Skyfall happens, and it's like, Bond, you're an old fart. What are you doing? You're old. And it's like, what the fuck happened in five years? It's because they take ten years off in between movies. (laughs) Jesus. It's just, like, the weirdest, like, whiplash. And Skyfall, you could tell, was written not to connect to anything. And then Spectre comes along, and it's like, oh, yeah, but... But uh, but do you see Javier it was Bardem? Me, James. He was working with us all along. The like, author of all your pain. That's the other thing that like the idea that like Blofeld has this personal vendetta while trying to take over the war. Excuse me, while trying to take over the world. Like, why? Why did anyone think this was a good idea? It's like I. Be- <laughs> it's like the villain of this movie became the most powerful criminal mastermind in the world just to spite his adoptive brother james bond yeah like oh so which is so stupid (laughs) so stupid like oh my god yeah like you can't even believe like uh but enough about specter uh (laughs) well no because specter fucking comes back in this movie (laughs) oh my god like the first hour is just specter 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 it's like i don't care i don't like specter i want just shut the fuck up i like specter i don't like this version of specter we are the most lethal criminal organization of all time. No, no, you really aren't. You're just kind of generic. You're not even that threatening. A guy undoes the whole of Spectre in one fell swoop. Well, you that's guys are like, nothing. that's You're such trash. hacky, like, writing, too, where it's like, you thought the bad guy in the last movie was bad. It, it's Rocky IV. It's like, you thought Apollo Creed was tough? This guy killed Apollo <laughs> Creed, so he's super tough. <laughs> you know, it, it's the exact same thing. It's like, oh, you thought Spectre was bad. This guy killed all of Spectre, so he's super bad. <laughs> like, I hate that shit. I hate using, like, last week's villain to as, like, uh, you like know. As uh, power creep. As power creep. As cannon fodder to yeah. set up this guy, this week's villain. It's like, just, just, just write an original story with a new villain that doesn't involve any other shit. You don't need to, yeah. you know, like, oh, last guy's bad guy is lunch for this t- this week's bad guy. Yeah, I agree. I mean, with all that said, I, I did like the I did like the scene as Christoph Waltz as Blofeld. I, I enjoyed it, even though. Okay, so Kerry Fukunaga decided after finishing the movie not to touch it, even though it was delayed. He could have gone back in. And tightened it up and re-edited it. And he was he like, could have no, gone back in and to. made it 90 minutes, but he didn't. <laughs> Cut out all of the Spectre <laughs> stuff. Just put in like, it's like, all right, guys, we're going to need some uh, some really good voiceover in this scene here. We're taking out uh, Christoph Waltz. And like, I think you can kind of see that some of it is definitely, it could have been tightened. And I think if you tighten everything that needs to be tightened in the movie, you could probably get it down to a manageable, oh God, two and a half hours. Well, wow, that's like, the thing. It's like the movie moves along at a pretty tidy pace. Like it's not slow yeah. by any means. Yeah, that was the other thing. Is like it's, it's just hauled ass. Yeah, so it's like every. It's like they got in everything they wanted to get in in the shortest amount of time possible, which is <laughs> insane. <laughs> yeah, because it's like because it's like all the, all all this effort to tie it together and have this big be, have it be this big Avengers Endgame style finale that concludes the Daniel Craig saga which isn't even a saga like I don't understand why they bothered um you know it, it, it all that diminishes the movie from what it could have been because it's like everything that is 
uh, new to just this movie is really good. But yeah. it is no time to shine, no pun intended, <laughs> because it's being constantly being oh smothered God. by the shadow of Spectre and Skyfall and Quantum of Solace and even a little bit of Casino Royale. Like all the other movies have to get their due before the movie that I'm watching right now can get it. So I was thinking of something, and I, I kind of want to go through the movie a little bit because I partially agree with you. I think the other problem is there are far too many characters in this movie, like way too many characters that lends itself, like especially new characters, that also lends itself to the idea of like, you know, I think I know what the episode's going to be called now, No Time to Shine. Um, but like, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. God damn it. But anyway, there were a lot of... Uh, new characters that like came and it's like oh this is great these are really you know they're they're relatively fun characters but good lord like why are they in here like um my you know everyone loves paloma because she's such a non-bond character and she comes in for a scene and i was like i think anadarmus is only going to be in here for a scene anyway because all i see is her in the like in all of the promotional material if she's even shown she's in the dress so I'm guessing she doesn't make it out. Um, I'm glad she made it out alive, but um, <laughs> yeah, I was kind of like, I was kind of like, they're really pushing Ana de Armas in this really hard when realistically they should be pushing. Um, uh, oh my god, um, Michelle Lynch. Yes, yeah, like she was. She's more of like the. Also, the Daniel Craig Bond. Like, I felt like the Bond girls kind of hit a good sweet spot with the Pierce Brosnan movies, maybe a little bit, maybe still a little bit weird, but then the Daniel Craig Bond girls, like they had no idea what the hell they were doing with them. Um, <laughs> like, but, um, but yeah, like Lashana Lynch, she's in it. You have Paloma. Um, you have a new villain who's supposed to be really intimidating. And like, the only reason they introduce him at the beginning is because you're not going to see him for like an hour and a half. I know. And then you it's see like, him again. Like, what the fuck? Like, the opening scene, I was like, wow, this, this bad guy seems pretty, uh, seems pretty intense. I wonder what he's about. And then I forgot about him because he doesn't, sh like, an hour later, he shows up and he's like, hey, it's the guy. Where's his, like, I liked his mask. I was, I was hoping that would show up again. Yeah, me too. And it, but no, it's just, it's just this endless babbling about Spectre for an hour. Like, what was the point of, of of uh, of Safin Lucifer, yeah. Having like his, this... his name is literally Lucifer. Lucifer. It's so As great. If you, I love it. Like, oh, I wonder if he's a bad guy. Hmm. I like how they don't even like. They're not even like gonna try it. They're just like, all right, we're gonna give him a fucked up face. We're gonna give him a weird gimmick. I know. It's like, and, like for for a movie that's so self aware of like all the tropes it plays into, it it doesn't comment at all that they have like the this. <laughs> this disfigured villain whose name is literally the devil. Lucifer. <laughs> it's like he is the evilest of the evil. And I, I mean, I guess it's like, I guess he kind of was, but I... <laughs> <laughs> it's like, there's this guy, his name is Lucifer Satan. Um, <laughs> his face is covered in scars. It's like, Oh no. Is he, uh, is he here to help us? That's the thing. He's not. He's our enemy. Oh, I wouldn't. I never would have guessed that. <laughs> and he wears. And he wears. He wears really creepy no masks. Gee, I wonder if he's gonna be the bad guy. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, there was like the the marketing material did a better job of making him seem intimidating than the actual goddamn movie. I know, because it's just like he's barely even in it. It's like, I know. that's what I mean. It's like the, he's the bad guy of this movie, and he's barely yes. in the movie. He has no time to live, live to make his mark to be a Bond villain. He's just it's just like Spectre, 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 Spectre. Oh, hey, look, it's Rami Malek. Spectre, 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 Spectre. Oh, Rami Malek died. The other thing that that baffled me was like, how old is this guy supposed to be? Right, because in the beginning he like goes in, and I think he's he supposed like... to be like a teenager in the beginning. Yeah, they. Mm. Yeah, that that's one I mean, of those it, things. That, yeah, like, it's it's one of those going things back. You have, to, you have to think it through. Yeah, it's like it's a fine line to walk where you're like, look, we're gonna 
you know, he, he's going to be like a teenager when he first appears and then he'll be like a, you know, an adult 30 years later, but we're going to have the same actor play both, uh, time periods and do absolutely nothing not that to it change even his mattered. appearance. Not that it even mattered. Cause you don't see his face in the beginning. Well, it also helps is, that Rami Malek looks problem. like he's both like 15 16 and 50. And 50. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think if they put a silver streak in his hair, that might have sold it a bit better. I actually, I thought they were going to go like full Hideo Kojima and be like his gimmick, even though he has like the nano, the, the nano bites thing. It's, oh it was God. all nano machines. I thought they were going to be like, yes, nano machines. I am ageless. I have everything is nano machines. revived. 50 he's, va- times. he's just vamp the vampire. He's just I was, no, nano machines. How are he? nano machines? Everything's nano machines. Yeah, everything is nano machines. Dude, I would. But if they were like, yes, I have found the cure to stay forever young. All I'd be like, you know what, dude? I'll buy it because I play Metal Gear Solid. That's fine yep. with me. Give well, him Metal Gear Solid really, is ultimately really a Bond gimmick. parody. So yeah. I there prefer Bond homage, but yeah, you're right. It's it's <laughs> it comes full circle. The first um, American James Bond, Solid Snake. <laughs> I think what's also interesting is that um, the plot of this movie is weirdly similar to Cowboy Bebop the movie. <laughs> yeah, ex- explain that. So Cowboy Bebop the movie is about a guy who unleashes a massive bioweapon on Mars City that ends up being nanomachines. And um, like this scene where they're like, oh, it's nanomachines just reminds me of the exact same scene where uh, like Edward looks under, looks at the disease under a microscope. It's like, oh, it's nanomachines. And it's like, they just babble about nanomachines for a while. And then like, are like the he, the hero Spike and and in the case of Cowboy Bebop and James Bond in the case of James Bond and the villain are both like kind of in love with the same woman, mm-hmm. um, and then like so she, and then she's kind of used as a pawn between the two of them and then they have this big climactic fight on um, in Cowboy Bebop it's on a tower in no time to die it's in a missile base but basically the villain is trying to unleash this nanomachine weapon across the world um for various reasons in 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 no time to die it's uh i don't i don't know why he wants to unleash it across the world they don't really explain what his his goal is or if they do they did a very bad job so i don't understand what his goal is they did a bad job. What he's going to do is he uses the nano machines for selection to create like a to kill all of the people who are inferior and cre- basically create a super race. He's basically he's basically the KKK. Oh, see, I didn't know that. Yeah, I watched I the movie and I had no that. idea. Yeah, yeah, I had uh. to read a summary for that. <laughs> and both and both of them have been poisoned. They're both like affected by the weapon that they're trying to use. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, like, so like you know, uh, Lucifer Satan. <laughs> has all those scars because he was poisoned um the guy in the villain in cowboy bebop vincent he was like a test subject for the nanomachine bioweapon and he's the only one who survived and one of the things that it does is it makes you hallucinate butterflies before you die and he's stuck in a state where he just hallucinates butterflies all the time and he believes that they come from like heaven or something so he thinks that if he kills enough people with this uh bioweapon that he can open a portal to the afterlife and walk through it um that's very that that's like it's very anime that's very 13 year old me thinking that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> which explains a lot of anime yeah it's like what are you sure you're not are you sure this is cowboy bebop and not like an episode of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> anyway, yeah, no, um, mm, yeah, it's very comic booky. I'm just thinking about like Thanos's different motivation in Infinity War versus uh, the actual comics, and that's like, yeah. yeah. Although if they gave Safin that, if they gave Lucifer that um, that motive, I'd be like, yeah, I can, I can see that. Which, by the way, his base. I don't know if you noticed this, but his base looked like the room of that Jared Leto 
um, was talking to uh, Harrison Ford in, in Blade Runner 2049. I didn't think and, it was quite that like that. I mean, I, there's some is it similarities. Just the architectural a little style? Bit. I, I guess so. I mean, obviously, the uh, what's his name? Jared, I, Jared Leto's evil lair is, I think, kind of a more Denis Villeneuve esque homage to the original Blade Runner, whereas this mm-hmm. is like, you know, because it's an island between like Japan and Siberia. So I think they want Siberia. to have like a, a fusion of the two cultures in a way. So he's like wearing like the decor is very Japanese, but the architecture is very Russian. Mm-hmm. Um, the Russian brutalism, I think they call it. Right. Mm-hmm. That could be wrong. Which I thought was cool. I liked his, his evil lair. Um, I, I couldn't stop thinking of Blade Runner for 2049. And I was like, this is going to ruin it for Gabe. He's going to hate this scene. And like Rami Malek's dressed in almost the exact same garb as Jared Leto. I was like, oh my God, this is, <laughs> this is real bad. I know. It's weird that like, I don't, like, you know, late 1800s Japanese, like, I guess leisure wear is like <laughs> villain attire now. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like, yeah, I don't know. Apparently there were a lot. <clears throat> I was reading um, trivia and one of the trivia points was like, because Carrie... Fukunaga is Asian. There's a lot of Asian imagery in this movie, and I'm like, I don't know if the two. I I don't. I don't think it's causation equals correlation. I just think it's just like, it just happened. They just wanted something different, and like, no masks are creepy, and no yeah, theater is weird. They are. For no is audiences. weird as fuck. <clears throat> I always I always crack up when people say like like no is the highest form of theater. And then they show a clip from a no play, and it's like absolute nonsense. <laughs> this is why you're not a theater guy, Gabe. Like, it's, we know it's, this already. It's just a dude in a mask on an empty stage gargling. Like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. <laughs> Gabe's just sitting there like, what the fuck am I watching? It's like, can't you see? Blah, 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 blah. It's like, how long is it lasting? It's no theater. It lasts five hours, Gabe. I, it just, it doesn't... <laughs> Buckle it, in, like, None of it, none of it computes. It's like, no theater is a mixture of, like, costume, and it's like, okay, weird-ass costume that looks kind of cool. Um, set design, there's no set. It's just a bare nope. stage. Yeah. Uh, and then it's like, singing, and it's just some dude going, like, he's just, like, gargling. Like, he's not, he's not uh, saying words or making noises. like... <laughs> And then, and dancing. And then it's like, the dancing is just like tapping his feet back and forth across the mat. And it's like, what the fuck is going on? I don't understand how this is a, meant to communicate anything. It's, and then it's like, I, this is one of the, this is one of the classic masterpieces of no theater. <laughs> it's like the Japanese Hamlet. And again, it's just incomprehensible nonsense. <laughs> God. It's called oh, no man. theater because I don't know what the I fuck's don't know going on. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the most exposure I have to no theater is uh, Kurosawa would use it to like give a feeling to his movies. So like all of his sinister female characters, like in Throne of Blood and Ron, all have like a strong element of no theater involved in their appearance and like the way they move. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. No theater seems creepy as all fuck. I don't want to be anywhere near it. So I'm, I'm good. I am very good. So. Yeah. I wonder how the Japanese today view like no theater. Are they like, oh, yes, this is like a national treasure or they're just like, I don't know. I don't get it either. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's on a scale. And I think, at, yeah, I think it's on a scale is the best way I can do it. Like, I'm sure they look at us and they're like, why would anyone want to watch Shakespeare unabridged? And like, and they're like, why is this guy talking so much? Why is he like monologuing well, but like, about the going Eng- to sleep? The English, like for them, Shakespeare is a national treasure. Like, like this is like right. the, Shakespeare's body of work for but a I, lot I, of English would... people is like this is this is English culture. This is the greatest like s- single thing we've ever produced. Whereas like I don't know if Japan is has the same feeling about no theater or if they're more like. I don't know, man. It's well, I mean, weird. but even in even in American society, like unless you're real, like a big fan, uh, or I mean, unless you're a fan of like English literature, language arts, that sort of thing. Well, I'm not talking about America because at... Shakespeare's not. American. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Although I think there are some people in in England who are like, 
This fucking blowhard. You had to stand up while watching it. Fuck this shit, you know, but anyway. They, they didn't have anything else to do, though. So, like, Shakespeare's like, let me make it longer, because, like, otherwise they're just going to die. So, we're going to go back home and, like, eat food with dirty hands. Like, they just took a shit, and now we're going to eat food. and die. No, 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 just stay in the theater. Just keep standing and watching my people play. So, anyway, <laughs> that's uh, whew, a way aside. But, yeah, I would guess that no theater is, because it, it goes back a lot further than Shakespeare in Japanese culture. There's like no theater in Kabuki, I think, and Kabuki is kind of like fun for the tourists, and Noah's for like the hardcore. No, the hardcore yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like Noah's like serious art, like it's like yeah. very highbrow shit. It's like opera, yeah. but opera's yeah. opera's also weird because like what little opera lyrics I've read, it's just people saying exactly what's happening. Yeah. So it's like if someone dies in opera, they just sing like "I'm dying," but in you know, in those like really exaggerated uh, the singing style that opera singers do. And then um, ribbons fly out of them to per, to be blood. It's like a bunch of ribbons fly out, but they're different colored. I like how ribbons are the operas. highbrow version, whereas like <laughs> in Shakespeare's plays, it's like here's a bag that we filled with real lamb's blood that you will rip open when you die. <laughs> Try not to drink any of it. What? Don't drink too much of it. Because <laughs> you have to drink more tomorrow. Um, all right. I'm going to bring it back to No Time to Die. Um, so uh, out, out of the stuff, what stuff did you like in the movie? Because obviously all of the Spectre stuff, for the most part, either, like, I, I don't think, for me, there was stuff that rose to like, okay, I'm glad it's in here. Like, I like seeing Leia Sado and... Apologies, but I liked seeing her in it, even though I never bought their romance in Spectre. I was like, mm -hmm. hey, hey, continue on, you know, she's in more of the movie than Vesper Lynn, so it's fine. Um, and like the repercussions that it caused. Um, and like I said, I like the Christoph Waltz scene. Um, and I like seeing Felix Leiter again. But uh, was there anything in particular in the movie that like anything, anything? What, what yeah, I like? mean, I thought the action was good. I thought the art direction was really good. A lot of the, like, sets and spaces that oh, they uh, go through in the movie look fantastic, and a lot of them are did very Did you see it in striking. a regular theater or an IMAX? A regular theater. Okay, I want to go back and watch it in IMAX because it was shot in IMAX. Hmm. Yeah. So it was shot in uh, Super 70 and, and IMAX. So now I'm like, all right, I should probably go back and... Yeah, Watch it in IMAX. I mean, the direction of the movie is really good. Um, I really like the, uh, I mean, just all the technical elements I really liked. Um, yeah. What else? I, you know, the performances are all great for for what they have to do. I think. Yeah. Um, the yeah. goofy humor was a little off putting, but it worked. Um, generally, just because like. Humor in Bond movies tends to not be very goofy. It tends to be more dry. Um, so it, was, it yeah. was weird to have, like, really silly humor in this, but it was okay. Like, it, you know, it, it, I don't know, it, man. it felt some out of, the, of place. Some of the Roger okay. Moore films have some, like, like really in there. Well, is it, like, re is it like jokes that are silly, or is it just shit that is silly because they didn't know what they were doing? I think some they of They didn't know how to manage tone. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a combination of both. Roger Moore just had to have his little jokes. Have to have your little jokes in there. It's like, oh, Bond should be fun and funny. Like, that was one of his, Sir Roger Moore's criticism of the Daniel Craig ones was he's like, they're too bloody serious. John, Bond should be goofy. Well, I mean, what? Bond, I think Bond should be funny, but, like, it, it's more funny in the, again, in that kind of dry sort of way that Sean Connery I, I was prefer, funny. Yeah, I prefer it's the like, dry... Like what's the one where he like he throw like he throws a toaster into a guy's bathtub and he's like ah oh, shocking, Golden you know eye. just this little finger, this little yeah. things like that you know, um, yeah like that's kind of like you know it's like the the Bond one liners are the on the opposite end of the spectrum from like nineteen eighties one liners, yeah you know <laughs> yes it's like uh, it's yeah. like if you could find a way to make. Like, it looks like you need to let off a little steam. But, like, make it cool and not silly. You're like, oh, that guy, that's ah, cool. He's, he's, he's witty. You know, it's like that. Yeah, um, I've, uh, 
I've distilled my love of Bond into like great action scenes, um, uh, gorgeous women, really, really goofy. Well, not really goofy, but really dry one liners mm -hmm. and like top tier fashion sense. Yep. Like if any of those are missing, nah. <laughs> so yeah, the goofy humor felt a little out of place, but it, it generally worked. And I mean, I think it helped with Paloma in some mm -hmm. sense. Um, it's like her and the, the Russian scientist were both like really silly. Yeah. Um, and also kind of Billy Magnuson. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Billy Magnuson. Which he felt like a bit of a misfire, even though oh. I know he's like, I, it seems like he's kind of a, a Fukunaga go-to suddenly. Is he? Was I don't he know. In, uh, he was, was in he Maniac. Maniac. Oh, fucking shit. Okay. So... Um, one, uh, I, the script needed a lot more tightening, but I like, this is probably controversial, but I like the pass that Phoebe Waller-Bridge did. Apparently she came in really late and just tightened up the dialogue. So if you didn't like a lot of that dialogue stuff, you can blame her. I like how she writes dialogue because I, I like Fleabag. So, um, so I'm going to be generous and say that the, the fun dialogue was her. So you can blame her if you didn't like it. Um, but uh, like her, she comes through a lot in the Paloma character. Like that mm. seems like a Phoebe Waller-Bridge character. Okay. Um, I mean, I think that character works in isolation. I don't know if it necessarily works within the context of a Bond movie. I mean, it's a weird thing. Like the movie is strange because it feels like it feels like the bloated two-part finale of a TV series. Yeah. Where it kind of like it changes tone in ways that aren't great um it it jumps around a lot without really going anywhere like it shows you all these different scenes and there's all these things happening but you kind of have this feeling for a while it's like okay where where is this going like there's not a lot of momentum yeah. for most of it um which is another issue because like in a spy thriller you want like a clear through line from beginning to end of like this is where the story is going this is where the tension is but with no time to die it felt like like structurally so probably not having to do with phoebe waller bridge um just structurally there was a lot of like okay i get that this is happening but like what does this have to do with anything um it's kind of the similar problem that you had in quantum of solace and in specter to me like that's that's what I noticed about both of those movies is it's like, all right, what the fuck are we doing? What's what's the goal? What's the mission? What's the objective? Why aren't we? Why isn't it clearly established what's happening or what we have to do next? Yeah. 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 I I know what you mean about that. I mean I think that the only like you say that uh, Paloma probably works in isolation. I think the only reason, she, even though they had that really on the nose line of like. She's like, strip. And he's like, okay, I guess we're going to just bang right here. Um, and she's like, oh, no, silly. We're spies. We don't do that anymore. You're so goofy. I was like, oh, my God. I get it. You don't have to, you don't have to be that on the nose. That aside, like, like, her general attitude and everything contrasted well with Daniel Craig. And obviously, they have, like, really good chemistry because they had it in Knives Out as well, at least mm -hmm. to me. Um, so like, apparently he handpicked her. He was like, Hey, you, Paloma, if we have a scene in Cuba, you should go with Ana de Armas for this. Cause she would be great. And I was like, yeah, yeah, she was great. You know? I mean, the whole Cuba sequence was really good. I mean, the, yeah. they, it looked fantastic. I mean, the way they lit the city and, um, the club and everything and the way they decorated everything just looked absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though it was uh, shot, I think in Jamaica. <laughs> yeah exactly um well, you can't, yeah you can't actually yeah, make no. movies in cuba that's the problem um they tr they tried with uh die another day apparently they were like yeah we'll we'll shoot in cuba and then the u.s was like no you're not and they're like yeah sure okay we'll shoot in spain um i did a lot i was reading a lot about no time to die just to make sure that i had a good uh point of reference and also do not viewers out there don't even bother looking at the IMDb trivia page. About 90% of it is just redundant information about how, like, about how the movie was going to be financed and distributed. It's, it was so boring. Anyway, um, 
uh, Billy Magnuson in this movie, I felt like him, like they could have set him up a lot better to be a lot more significant villain, but they had too many characters because they had the one-eyed guy with the bionic eye who has like an amazing death scene. Um, at least because I, you know, it's a Q gadget death scene, which are always, always great. Mm-hmm. But then you have Billy Magnuson as like the over, the over eager guy. I don't know why Billy Magnuson plays like the best character. I want to hate of all time. Like he just has like, I, I hate him. I hate all of his characters in every movie that I've seen him in either intentionally or unintentionally. And I guess that's a gift. I guess that's a gift, but like, I, mm, mm, cause I think he was in that, that new Aladdin movie. He was. And then they were like, they were like, Oh, Disney's going to make a spinoff with the, the, with Billy Magnuson's character for Aladdin. And, what? And, yeah. Did you? Yeah. It was hilarious. There was like this story going around that Disney was thinking of doing a spinoff. I don't know if it was a fake story, but I saw it in a lot of places and all these people were reacting like, oh, so you mean in a movie that had, that was like 99% like non-Anglo or non-white characters, the one character you're going to make a spinoff of is the one white dude. I was like, that's pretty mm-hmm. funny. It's pretty Disney. Um, it's very Disney. I think he was in Game Night too, and his character was just really annoying. Like that was the joke is like his character is annoying, but his his date is like awesome and they wanted his date to be there instead of him. So yeah, and then in this, where he's like the overachieving dude who ends up being, spoilers, a double agent and kills Felix Leiter, like, yeah. Um, I, I thought that his death scene was good, the scene where he turned him was good, but I didn't really feel, like, he didn't have enough significant screen time to deserve, like, that brutal a death to me. I don't know, I mean, it's just, again, this, this movie mismanages its time quite a lot. Like, is, do you think there's anything they could... Because to me... <laughs> they have like all the would, time in the world they, and they wasted so much of it. <laughs> <laughs> Louis Armstrong from his grave. God damn it! Um, <laughs> like, that that's the thing that, like, I was thinking back. Like, uh, I feel like it definitely could have used one more pass at the script to try and get rid of some things. And I'm sure... Because part of it was that they went into filming without a completed script, I think. I think this was another one of those... Oh, like, boy. Qu- like, Quantum of Solace did the same thing. I'm sure Spectre did the same thing, where they're like, we have roughly what we want to do, but we don't have everything. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you shows. could... If you got rid of all references to Spectre, you got rid of all references to previous movies, get rid of the prologue in uh, Italy, you could probably cut this down to 45 minutes, put Rami Mal Or cut this down by 45 minutes. Um you don't want a 45 minute long movie. Uh, <laughs> make Rami like put Rami Malek front and center so he's like he's there from the beginning. Well, he was through there to from the, the beginning, end, through to the end. Um I think you have a stronger movie. Like make yeah. it about Rami Malek and then make it more focused. Make it about Rami Malek, make it about Madeline Swan and James Bond, just the three of them and then kind of like everyone else is like just kind of a cameo you know yeah um, i think that would make a much stronger movie because the other thing it's like I, i've seen a lot of people criticizing uh malik's character and his performance and stuff i thought he was good like i yeah. thought he did a good job i think lucifer satan in spite of the name <laughs> is uh is an interesting character and and could potentially make a good bond villain Mm-hmm. Um, he's got potential. <laughs> Too bad he's dead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they bring him back in the next Bond movie. How did they bring him back? The same way they brought back Bond. They just wanted to bring him back. Just put him back in. <laughs> the uh, Crow, the Love Never Dies, something like that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't know this, but the uh, sequel to Phantom of the Opera is called Love Never Dies. So oh, it's boy. even funnier. So That's, then he comes back with like half of a mask, but it's like the phantom mask instead of the It's half no of mask. the no mask. Um, <laughs> he already has that though. He's basically the phantom. Uh, basically, anyway. yeah. So yeah, it's uh, you know you, you, you make him you, yeah you make him give him a bigger role. You just make it about those three characters. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone else is just sort of relegated to a cameo. You could still have the Cuba scene. But just recontextualize it. Get rid of Billy Magnuson. Get rid of Felix Leiter. They don't have to. No, 
No. Uh, I love Felix Leiter. I know you do. <laughs> I had a brother. His name was Felix Leiter. I was like, oh, all the emotions. I was, I was like, like wow, yeah. that was really impactful considering, you know, Jeffrey Wright has like, 10 minutes of screen time across the entire <laughs> franchise. Um, he introduces himself to Bond as brother. I was like, yeah. Uh, his brother from the CIA. Goddamn. <laughs> Quantum of Solace. David Harbour's in Quantum of Solace. He plays the higher up that uh, Felix Leiter has to work with. Anyway, I thought that was I've tried to forget that movie. Um, oh, you, you, you do well, too. You do well, too. I can tell you what's wrong with it, but uh, I don't want to dwell on it. Um, There's a little thing called editing that they no. didn't know about when they made that movie. Oh, God. Uh. <laughs> There's a little thing called... Uh, actually, an interesting conversation would be why Casino Royale... Were, like, why Martin Campbell is actually good at directing these big-budget spectacles while other directors have a problem with them. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, that, that's, that's not for here. Um, go on. Get rid of Felix Leiter, you bastard. Yep. Just cut him. Just cut um, him. You could probably even have... You could you could still have Lashana Lynch, because I think you could do the... Like, Bond retires to go be with Madeline Swan. Their honeymoon or getaway or whatever it goes to shit because of Lucifer Satan. <laughs> um, I'm just going to keep calling him that because it's hilarious. Uh, I, guess I laugh every time you say it. <laughs> and then, you know, like in the meantime, Lashana Lynch is the new 007. Um, Bond and Madeline Swan have to defend themselves, but it's difficult because Bond's not an agent anymore. He doesn't have the resources and the backing of MI6 anymore. So he's like mm -hmm. on his own. So he has to go back to MI6 and be like, you know, like help me out here. And, you know, it, it could be kind of like a mutual thing where it's like, you know, uh, Lucifer has uh, MI6's bioweapon. Oh, also part of the subplot is like M helped create the nanomachines. The, yeah, Project uh, Heracles. Lucifer wants to use. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll get into why that's weird in a minute. But before we get to that, you know, it could be like, you know, uh, Bond goes to MI6 and it's like, you know, this, this guy is trying to kill me and like abduct my wife. You know, what's going on? And then uh, M is like, well, turns out, you know, we built a bioweapon and this guy took it and we want, we need you, we need to stop him so it doesn't like get out into the world that we made this thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like a mutual, like, okay, we begrudgingly, like I'm brought back in and we help each other out sort of a situation. Um, and then they have to go stop uh, Lucifer Satan, who maybe, I don't know, kidnaps Madeline Swan in the process somewhere. And he's like, I, Bond's like, I gotta s save my wife. And, um, uh, no time to save the wife. You know, time to save the wife. And, uh, the, and M is like, and make sure you, you destroy the bioweapon so no one knows that we uh, almost ended the world again. Um, and then it's bam, there's Bond. there's your movie, and 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 uh, Bond and Lash and Lashana Lynch don't like each other, but in uh, they, they, you know, they they go about things in two very different ways. Bond is old school, Lashana Lynch is new school, um, but they they are able to put their differences aside and work together to complete the mission. Man, it's almost like you've watched movies before. I know it's, like it's amazing. almost amazing. It's almost amazing, like I just dude. I just took every fucking spy movie <laughs> ever made to synthesize a generic Bond movie that's better than the one that they made. <laughs> Eon Productions, we are here. Gabe is here. He is ready to block out the story and potentially write it. And you could do the whole thing in two hours or less. And I would say two hours. Two hours is a good amount of time. Two solid hours. Because like... You don't want to go too close to that one hour, 45 minute. Hey, these are Bond movies, you know? You have to hit different locales. You got to go around the world, jet setting for no yeah, other reason like than because the Bond to movies to have to right? have a bit of a slower pace than your standard action movie. And they need to have a little bit of a bigger scale where there's more like globe trotting. The world may be in danger. Not mm -hmm. always, but it might be. Um, yeah, a little bit. One thing that the movies have been kind of missing is like the mystery aspect of it. And I think like Skyfall kind of had that where they're like, who is this guy? It's like, okay, first half Bond has to uncover the mystery. And then the second half Bond has to take down um, the mystery he was uncovering. So, yeah. 
Um, I, but you were talking about uh, Lashana Lynch and like the two, like Bond is old school, which <clears throat> a quick aside, Bond dressed in like, you know, a thousand dollar casual clothes goes to infiltrate the, the, the bait, the bad guy's base next to Lashana Lynch, who was wearing tactical gear. And I was like, what the hell is wrong with you, Bond? Why aren't you wearing tactical gear? So that, uh, like, Mike, I love this the... tactical tuxedo. Apparently, I they they were selling the the sweater online. I was like, really? <laughs> How much is this gonna be? It's like four hundred and forty dollars. It's like army tactical. I was like, what the? This is not a tactical sweater. What's a tactical sweater? Ah, uh, that's it, it's like the Chuck Norris uh, kicking jeans. It's jeans, but <clears throat> there's a lot of room at the joints. It's like a sweater that makes you sound invisible. It's an Elvis <laughs> sweater. Like, no, this is this looks like something you like. Oh, it's too cold outside. Let me put this on. Like, ah, uh, God. Oh my gosh. Um, but the one thing I did like about this movie was they've been kind of hinting at it for a while. But this is the first movie where it felt like Q actually had a fun time showing off gadgets. I thought the whole like I think he called it Qdar. I, I laughed at that. I think I was the only person in the theater who did. I was like, that's funny. It'll give you a 3D readout of the whole place. I was like, oh, that, that, that's funny. And he called it Qdar because he's, you know, an egotistical nerd. <laughs> um, and then the watch that had, <laughs> it's not field tested Bond. I was like, oh, that, that's fun too. So like, I like it when they have uh, fun Q. I don't know why they thought that they needed to get rid of the Q gadgets. I know it got ridiculous by the time um, Die Another Day. Born Identity. The invisible car. Oh, God. Born Identity happened. They rebooted Bond with Daniel Craig, and like we have to, we have to strip it down so it's more like Born Identity. People don't want Die Another Day with space lasers and invisible cars. The, like, and then like three Mission Impossible movies come out, and people are like, you know what? Maybe gadgets are okay. Actually. Well, exactly. Like, I mean, it's fun. like they kind of they overcorrected and then kind of brought it back, which is how these things work, you know? Yeah. Yeah, like I thought, I, I wanted one more like super cool gadget ridden modern car. For some reason, they're obsessed with like the classic Goldfinger car and like apparently the car from the from 1986. But I was like, you know what? That's great, but give me something new, man. I want to see a new car in these movies. Um, this movie was definitely like Bond 25th. We're going to give all of the references. So I guess I can understand that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I feel like there's more to talk about on this movie. Um, oh, yeah, there are two, at least two things. Um, let's get into spoilers for the ending, even though we've kind of spoiled a lot of it already. You know that I don't like the ending. I think you had a, a different opinion of it. I mean, it, I didn't care. Bond died, and that was whatever. It's like, I don't know. It felt like a cheap attempt to recreate the same kind of like moment where which i haven't seen but i know it's a big deal where tony stark you know dies to save the universe like they want that kind of a uh a little emotional payoff yeah um but it's just like we 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 barely know daniel craig's james (laughs) bond like he we've seen him for four movies again two and a half at least for me, two for most other people, of which we've just tried to forget and, and drink out of our memory. Um, so, yeah, it's like there's not a whole lot of attachment to seeing him get, you know, blown Blow to pieces. The shit up, yeah. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's like, this is the most unbond Bond movie ever because he's like this <laughs> sappy family man now. And he's like, and then he, he just gets blown the blown fuck up. The fuck up. <laughs> and it's he like, like this... goes in a very Bond-ish way, I guess. <laughs> I guess, but it's like it's weird because a lot of the scale of the Bond movies are they tend to be smaller than like a superhero movie where it's like it's not like the whole world's in danger, but it's like a particular country's national security is in danger or like or something like that, like, you know, oh, uh, Goldfinger's trying to 
irradiate Fort Knox so his gold will be worth more, or there's terrorists trying to launder money through the Casino Royale in Montenegro. Oh, there's a mysterious island in the Caribbean where one of our agents was killed. Um, it's it's like kind of smaller yeah. stuff like that. Whereas it's like this one, it's like will cost this is like the Bond yeah. version. If we have to save the world from a giant blue laser from the sky, you know. Mm -hmm. Because, again, like, Rami Malek's whole plan is, like, I'm going to destroy the world with my super weapon for reasons that are not very well articulated. Right. I feel like on a second watch, It's like Thanos is going to wipe out half the universe. It just felt like that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's crazier because he can choose exactly who, whereas Thanos is just random. But I'm just kidding. Um, Yeah, I... Yeah, I agree with you. Um the with the bond move or like at least with the bond novels it it w- it felt like <clears throat> if he failed it would be the domino effect that could cause the soviets to 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 rule the world whereas like with this it's like we're going to skip that whole thing about like a domino it's just like the world is fucked bond he saved the world five times from the world being fucked well, yeah, it's like, because all One the Bond man. stuff happens, like, in the shadows. It's, like, it's mm-hmm. like things that a casual observer wouldn't know Yeah, um, are going to, like, no one knows the world is at stake except Bond and his enemies, you know? It's, it's all very, like, hidden, yeah. with the exception of Die Another Day, where they literally had a giant sky laser. And, <laughs> and Moonraker, too, I and think. And this. Moonraker. Oh, yeah, and Moonraker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and No Time to Die, where it's, like, the world is in very immediate danger. Like this guy is going to blow up the earth. Yeah. Um, he's and, gonna blow and, up, I'm going to blow up the sun, James Bond. You better stop me. <laughs> it's like, oh no, we have to stop this guy. He's going to blow up the sun. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know? He's going to create a nuclear winter, but he has the only location that is actually powered by moon energy. And therefore he's going to charge everyone a ton of money to live in his in his moon-powered base, so that yeah, no, no, just it always involves like charging really high fees, like upsetting the free market. Well, like, what was the? It's like the weird. It's some of the movie, some of the villain movie plots that these Hollywood writers come up with are truly just bizarre. Like, like uh, Lex Luthor wants to destroy oh, yeah. and it, like half the country, so that property he buys in iowa will be oceanfront real estate or something like that um it's like what <laughs> like that, that doesn't make any fucking sense <laughs> it's like what the fuck but That's like so in modern stupid. day he's like i want to blow up iowa so that there's more oceanfront property but also i hate iowa because i have a personal vendetta against the entire because... state Because Clark Kent (laughs) is my adoptive brother, and I want to spite him (laughs) by blowing up his whatever his home to Smallville. Oh my god! Oh, so bad! Oh Jesus! Which is yeah, yeah. Like those those evil villain plans never made any sense to me. It's like why not just? I don't know. Like why not just buy oceanfront property (laughs) if you want oceanfront (laughs) property? Well, that was the thing about some of the like. Like, the, why not uh, kill someone who owns oceanfront property and take it? Like, that's an easier evil way to get oceanfront property than to like destroy yeah. a <clears throat> continent. So, uh, do you remember what? I know it's been a while, but do you remember what uh, Javier Bardem's plan was in Skyfall? I really should know his name, and I can't think of it. Silva. But do you know what his Silva? Yeah, that's right. Silva's plan that doesn't make any sense. Um, do you remember what his motivation was? He wants to kill mommy because he's a Freudian weirdo. Like that, that's his motivation. Like he could do anything. That's a good motivation though. It's weird. It's It's creepy and it's It's simple simple. and it works. Like, and the other thing too, it's like, it's clear villain. Exactly. It's clear. Like villains who do Mm. shit for money. A lot of times their plans don't make any sense. It's like, you're, you're going to destroy half the planet to get rich. I feel like there's easier ways to get rich. Whereas well, if it's like forget. some weird like philosophical or pathological thing where it's like it, you can't reason with them, like like Silva has this weird Freudian thing with Judy Dench, yep. and he has to kill her because she's his like evil mother that he hates. Um, like they, that works because it, it 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 it's like 
you can't reason with it. You can't say like that's a There's stupid no way to plan. Justify. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. because the justification only matters to him. It's like it's right. his own pathology. Um it it's kind of like it's like I always like the the plan of um like big boss. Right? His boss. whole thing <clears throat> yeah. Cuz his whole his his uh, motivations are purely based on like emotion and sentiment. There's no logic to it. There's no reasoning with it. It's just like he has this belief like deep 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 in his heart that like this has to this is the thing the way things need to be and he has to make it happen, right? Cuz it's like his whole plan is he wants to use uh metal gear and their nuclear weapons to destabilize the world so that the world is in a constant state of warfare and soldiers like him will always have a purpose. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's his motivation. It's like he he is so desperate for his life to mean something that he's willing to throw the entire world into chaos so that he personally can find meaning in his own life. And like that like you can't you can't reason him out of that. There's no like, well that's stupid. You know? <laughs> it's yeah. just cuz it's, it's 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 so personal, it's so emotional. Like, those are good villain motivations. And, I mean, I guess, like, Rami Malek, I think that's, that, that is the one aspect of his character that falls short, is, like, they don't explain why he wants to destroy half the world with his super weapon. It's just like, I'm going to destroy the world because I'm evil. Ha, 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 ha. Which, to be fair, I, so, I do like villains who are evil just for the sake of being evil. I think there's... Uh, there's a place for that. There's a place for them. I it's called Venom. It. <laughs> no, I mean, I think like I think like one thing that we've gotten into is like we have villains who we try to make so relatable to the audience that sometimes their motivations get too confused. Like I always think back to Thanos and how everyone's like, well, no, Thanos's idea of like genocide is good actually, and I'm like, really? Like they tried way too hard to make him sympathetic then. And you know what? Sometimes I just want a bad guy who's just a fucking lunatic bad guy. Like, it's fine. Just, like, like, uh, like, give me the Maleficent who actually does something evil. Like, that's what I want. I don't need... Like, they're obviously, to make well, a villain it's effective, like, there it, should it, be it, relatability, but there should be just enough relatability. It, but it, like, again, I it's like, it's like not evil. an emotional reason you can even connect to with Safin. I mean, it's like, right. if, if his plan was... You mean Lucifer... Yeah, Lucifer. Um, if his evil plan was entirely connected to his obsession with Madeline Swan, that's your like that like that. That's your in. That's your in. It's him, Madeline Swan, James Bond. Like that conflict is the conflict, mm -hmm. and everything he does should be based around that. Like that's the emotional center, not like I need to destroy the world for reasons that are just sort of throwaway and tangential. Um, I will overthrow. I will destroy the world and hold it for ransom, like Scarecrow in Batman Begins. <laughs> like, yeah, there you go. Um, I, no, I agree. Like that was the other weird thing about the movie is like after saving Madeline, you know, uh, villain guy doesn't come back into her life until like a bunch of years later, which is really weird. Like I thought that they because one thing I thought they were gonna do was they were going to have like an apples to apples comparison, like um, L Lucifer versus Bond. Like, look at how similar we are. And what's the one dry, you know, dividing <laughs> factor? I really, yeah, I really like the part where he's, he gives the whole like, you and I are not so different <laughs> speech, but it makes absolutely no sense because they're nothing alike. <laughs> I know, like this could have, this could have been that much. They did a similar thing with um, with Silva, where like Silva is the negative inverse of Bond, and Bond is for the good, and Silva is for the bad. And it's like you could have driven it further with uh, with with Lucifer because they both share a common connection with Madeline Swan. You make them exactly this. Uh, uh, yeah, it seemed like a wasted opportunity. You don't even have to make them like weird opposites of each other, or like you know, like because Bond is so many times Bond is squared off against an enemy who is like a you know twisted mirror mirror version of himself whether it's his predecessor in goldeneye his mm -hmm. other yeah. predecessor in skyfall 
or like <laughs> just just another spy assassin dude in the man with the golden gun yeah you know christopher lee yeah sorry um <laughs> so i'm gonna you had an issue you had a huge issue with project heracles or at least m green lighting project heracles the movie oh yeah so it's weird that the main villain is from a family of poisoners, mm -hmm. and his great poison is one that he didn't even make. I mean, I could give you the sort of like, if I were writing an essay justification for it, that that might help. But I mean, if you'd like to hear it, I can give it to you. Well, it's just like he seems, the character as written is so invested in his family's like, heritage and lineage as poison makers and mm -hmm. takes a great deal of pride in what they were and what they did um but like he's kind of conceding that m's idea is better than anything he or his family has have ever come up with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean like i i didn't think about it a lot but my go-to would be um like when you're making poisons you're taking plants that aren't necessarily bad on their own and you extract something from it or you change something in it and make it a deadly a deadly weapon and in this case he was taking i mean like in in isolation it could be deadly but then you're taking that isolated product and you're morphing it to something widespread that could kill for example like um, if you touch poison oak like you can you you don't necessarily have to be this is again this is a stretch but you know if you're never around poison oak then you're never affected by it. But if someone takes that poison oak, weaponizes it, and finds a way to spread it, then all of a sudden, like, you've taken something that's just a defense mechanism to protect itself, and you've, you know, created a huge... Man, this is this is really a weapon. stretch. You might as well be doing I yoga know. right now. <laughs> really? Yoga? Dang. Um, but, like, he's, he's taking what... The thing is, it's... It's a good weapon idea... That is so easy to like be corrupted. Like, why why would you have the ego to even say yes, we'll do this without proper protocols on it? And I guess that's the main thing is like M should have chosen the scientist more intelligently. But like Jesus Christ. Yeah, I don't know. I mean it's the whole thing is like weird because it's not really ever explained, like like, why is this guy who has so much pride in his heritage and his family um, just using someone else's idea, it ba essentially admitting it that it's better than anything he's ever done? Um, why is there, like, this weird cult around him? Yeah. Like, like why Why are the... Why is that one Russian dude and why, are Billy, why is Billy Magnuson, like, such slavish followers of him when his ideas are so... They're, like, no win for anyone. Like, everyone loses. Um, yeah. like what is this doctrine that he's preaching because i mean the guy with the one eye he turns like super fast it's like really does he have just that much Not, he has to have a lot of money because he has his own private island but still like does yeah he really like billy madison's to... acting as his recruiter it's like how is yeah. he recruiting people it's like if you join our cause everyone will die and the guy's like wow i can't argue with that that sounds amazing like yeah like i'll i'll even work for free you know i'll work for equity like I'll work <laughs> <laughs> as long as my eye survives that's fine that's all i need like what i guess <laughs> um i still love his death though like 10 out of 10 that was yes um, his death is pretty great which also i love the uh the 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 long take action scene going up the staircase like i know it's I know, I know. One or one or action scenes are played out, but it was just like felt like a nice throw. Well, especially staircase detective. ones are played out, considering that Atomic Blonde has one. Yeah, you well, have one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it did. It did remind me of Shades of that too. I was like, ah, it's... Carrie, Carrie Fukunaga, you and I are on the same wavelength here. Yeah, no, but it was it was nice to see. Like you know. It was shot in an IMAX camera. I don't think I'll ever. I, I don't think I'll ever see Christopher Nolan do like a really elaborate one take like that. He's, well, not that it was Nolan super... is not a one take guy. He is. He is not. Uh, cut and cut on time. Uh, <laughs> it's like cut the camera. We don't need this. He's uh, like my frames are beautiful if you pause them, kind of guy. 
Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, what did you think of Fukunaga? Um, so I actually have to defer this to you more than me. Like I was, I was rooting for him. So I'm biased oh, yeah, on me this. Too. Um, I, so I read a couple of interesting things about it, but I'm going to defer to you on this more than me because you've seen all of Maniac. You've watched all of Beasts of No Nation. Um, hell, you probably have seen his version of Jane Eyre or seen Nombre. So. I have not seen those two, but I've seen okay. the other ones. Um, so to me, I thought he was pretty good. Um, what I mean by that is I thought the action scenes were pretty good, but they didn't have, like a lot of people were complaining about the action scenes not having that bombastic feel. I think that they went for mood a lot of the time. Like the scene in Norway where he's like stealth taking down all the guys was, oh, that was awesome. That was my, that was Wait, my Does thing. he drive from England to Norway? I think they fly in okay. to Norway. They, they just cut and he's in Norway. I yeah, that, that really yeah. threw me for a loop. Yeah, I that was I will say that was the one scene where like when they were driving and being chased, like that's where in Norway my mind went blank. I was like, oh my god, why are there so many chase scenes? <laughs> um, and it made me think of Ronan. I was like, you know what? When I talk to Gabe, I want to, I should rewatch Ronan because that had a great, <laughs> that had a great chase scene. <laughs> um, so, but I like I think there there were little touches like the the long take, um, the character work especially. I think that his emphasis on like having really strong character personalities and having really strong interactions with the characters. Like uh, I know he brought, I think he was the one who brought on uh, Phoebe Waller bridge to help with the screenplay and get like more character focus in here. Fukunaga and, like, did or Craig? yeah, I think so. I think Fukunaga did. Um, it might've been Craig, but um, I think all of that stuff worked really well. Um, I feel like he didn't have as much control over, or, or at least he wasn't quite sure how to make the action scenes as, as like epic as we'd seen in. I, I'm gonna go back to Skyfall a lot, um, but I don't know if that was necessarily bad. Like it felt like a very intimate movie, and the action scenes kind of, um, kind of followed that form. Well, I would say most Bond movies don't have epic action scenes because they're spy movies. You know, they're typically like. He fights dudes in close quarters. There's a car chase, maybe. And that's kind of it. There aren't, like, these huge... There typically aren't massive battles or shootouts. No, but they usually have some, like, pretty um, standout set pieces. Like, at the end of Casino Royale, they have the... They, they're going through Venice, and the building is, like, collapsing in on them as they're... Yes, as going from but point it's more of, like, a foot chase through a collapsing building... With, or, like, like, the beginning of Skyfall, like, all of that stuff happening on the... Tr like, how it moves... From the apartment. Yeah, to the, I mean that that one's pretty big, you know, but yeah, I would say, and like you have that in here with the chase scene through. But that's just it. Like I did, I the chase scenes were pretty cool, but like, you know, the 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 action scene that I remember is the one in Norway where he's like solid snaking all the people. Like I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Or like the the sneaking around of the in the final base. There wasn't like an mm -hmm. epic moment of them coming in. There was, there was, there was the glider that flies in. So yeah, I guess that's, that's the case there. But yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I liked his direction. I thought he did a very good job, especially given the script that he was working with. Um, mm -hmm. Well, he was know, a co-screenwriter. So it's partly his fault. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he redeems it in the direction. Yeah. Because like, like I said, the, the movie looks great. It, he does a really good job of picking the right shots to frame a particular moment, mm -hmm. um, directing your attention to the right places, um, keeping things visually interesting and yeah. not like over editing or under editing. Um, the action scenes I thought were all really good for, for bond. Um, you know, there's, because, I, I mean, I'm kind of just comparing it to not some, like, just other Daniel Craig Bond movies, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I would say the, like, like, Casino Royale has some really great action sequences, but some of them are a little touch and go just because they, they might try a little too hard to be like the Bourne movies. Um, you know, Skyfall has some great action sequences. 
Uh, but those are those tend to be a little more mellow, uh, just because Sam Mendes and Roger Deakins keep things pretty steady. I mean, it, one thing I thought that was really interesting is uh, Fukunaga likes to move the camera a lot, um, yeah. and it's in a very considerate way. Roger Deakins doesn't like to move the camera at all unless he absolutely has to. And mm-hmm. then it's it's in a very considerate way. Um, Martin Campbell is he's more just moving the camera in like the way you would expect for a, a big a big studio director to do it, you know. Right. Um, it doesn't it, there's not like a personal it doesn't have as much of a personal touch. It's more like it's more functional. Um whereas like the the cinematography and editing and direction in Quantum of Solace is an absolute shit show. Um, <laughs> like you can, you literally can't tell what's happening a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought, I thought he did a really good job. Um, you know, it seemed like everything was done with intent and that intent came through and it worked. I think the only, the only parts that didn't really work for me technically were basically the very end where everything is just washed in like warm yellow tones and you know bond is staring into the sun and like this weirdly romantic light as he blows up um a lot of that stuff i think didn't work for me personally yeah. just because there is uh it's too schmaltzy it's too schmaltzy <clears throat> the movie has a lot of hard edges um visually throughout that all just sort of melt away for this like or warm glow of the setting sun in the the final few minutes and it's like that that warm glow of the setting sun is in every scene at the end like it's bond's death the aftermath of bond's death them drinking like mi6 drinking in m's office and madeline swan driving like they all have the exact same uh you know sun-kissed glow to them that is just yeah seems so out of place in a spy movie um so i did not care for that i get why they did it i get the the kind of the the visual language behind it i did not care for it though i i understand why they wanted so much finality by killing bond and i know daniel craig was like i'm only coming back if you kill bond which I know it's going to sound really pretentious of me, but like when you kill off your hero without leaving them any sort of like satisfying or happy ending, not that this, when you kill off your main hero, it's very hard to do it in a satisfying way where it doesn't just come off as like sort of like a, like cheap, cheap returns, I guess is the cheap returns is what I'm trying to say. Because like, I feel like there was a better way to give, this character a send off other than like, we're going to kill him and that'll well, be worth it all. To, again, to compare this to cowboy bebop, um, <laughs> spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen it. Spike dies at the end um, <laughs> of the, sh- of the series, not of the movie. Um, right. And that I felt was done in a very satisfying way because it's like, you know, yeah, he's this very likable main character. You've been with him for X number of episodes, but like, he like the the whole thing with Bond is like there's always something left for him to do, mm-hmm. you know. It's like James Bond will return in X, and there's like a life for him beyond whatever the movie is. But right. with Cowboy Bebop, like at the end of the show when Spike dies, like he really has nothing left to live for. Like he welcomes his own death at that point because his journey is is really truly over. Yeah, um, and that and that that is a hard thing to pull off, but they make it work in that show. Yeah, and well, I mean, it even works to me. It even works in the Dark Knight Rises, where you know Batman had one motivation to clean up the streets of Gotham, and you know they build up the moment with everything, and it gets very Spielbergy, like you've given this city everything, not everything, not yet, and you know, <laughs> you know takes it off, and, um, and like, like. I came away from that and I was like, cool, that works. Like, it works because thematically there was nothing he could do to divorce himself from the Batman character, Mm -hmm. and now he can. Whereas with No Time to Die, it's like, I'm going to die even though I just found out that I have a daughter and, like, the woman I love did not actually betray me. This is going to be a very poignant moment as my guts get obliterated 
on top of this like Russian Japanese island. Like, I don't know. I thought it was a bad send off. I mean, there was never it anything. Was. There was there was never anything in his retirement where you're like, oh, Bond is haunted by his past. No, he brought he got brought back into it by Felix Leiter and Lashana Lynch. Like, you could have had him ride off into the sunset, and like that would have been satisfying for me. Cliche. You yeah, have but Bond's not rewriting. <laughs> you have him well, and rewriting. M driving side by side, and it plays that stupid song from uh, Fast and Furious. Is like their roads their paths diverge <laughs> and you, Bond like, drives off into the sunset like Paul Walker. It's like literally the end of, uh, at the end of Indiana Jones and the, uh, and the last crusade where it's just, instead of Harrison Ford, it's Daniel Craig riding a horse. And like, you have Sean Connery there riding a horse as his father. <laughs> it's like, yeah, there you go. There's the ending. But like, I think having, having that like sail off into the sunset with his family, he's a happy man. The world is significantly more safer and now he can enjoy it. Like, now he's no longer tortured. Like, okay, that makes sense. Maybe if they pushed how tortured a person he was. Um, Which they really should have if that was the arc. they Because the arc they're going for is, like, Bond is a bad person. Now he has a reason to be good. Um, yeah. Which they instead don't totally pull off. Yeah, like, it, instead it just basically sets up, like, Bond had parental issues because he was an orphan. Guess what? Let's kill off Madeline Swan, and then her daughter can have parental issues because she's an orphan, <laughs> and the cycle continues. Like, no, it's just no. I, I I did not like the ending. Yeah, I mean, it. You could have taken this in a very different route, where it's like the professional almost, and uh, you know, Bond has to train his daughter, who he doesn't totally know as <laughs> his daughter, in the ways of being a spy. Um, but. I think one of the one of the major issues with this movie and some of the Daniel Craig Bond movies in general is they're too they're too trendy, you know? They're too yeah. self-aware. Like Bond is kind of a a relic of another age which is not necessarily a bad thing, but they try to comment on that continuously. And it's like it's like we need to it's like it's like with uh fucking Spectre, you know, it's like, oh, spies used to be this, but now they're this. Bond is old fashioned. I mean, Skyfall too. Like, like oh, all the that fucking the metaphors theory. in Skyfall about yeah, like, that was the theme like, of Skyfall. The old ship being dragged off in this painting. It's a metaphor for you, James. Isn't that clever? We're using fine art to frame the the the, the thematic conflict of this movie. No, Which the, also yeah. like the whole the whole like Bond is a relic and and is kind of a it belongs to a bygone era goes completely out the window in the end because mm. it's like well. Turns out, like, you know, you may be a relic of a bygone era, and this bad guy is very tech savvy, but none of it matters because the bad guy throws away, Silva throws away all of his tech savviness to go and duke it out in an old building, which is also <laughs> laden with thematic meaning. Um, well, the, the theme of, of Skyfall is, you know, best summarized by my favorite character, Kincaid. Sometimes the old ways are the best, and he lays down that knife, and you're like, fuck yeah, they are. <laughs> That's but, that's like, another reason I like Skyfall is that like if you don't understand what film metaphors are, watch Skyfall and you will be bashed over the head. <laughs> like, you'll have your nose broken with the number oh my of God, fucking film metaphors. Like there are. literally, a th they have they only have a th uh, scene where Bond gets shaved. One, it advances the plot. Two, it's a nice scene where Money Penny and Bond get to flirt. Which you know what? You don't need Lashana Lynch. Just have Money Penny and Bond flirting the whole time in the movie. Bring her back in. Well, um, the point of and then three to her isn't to flirt. Yeah. It's to provide yeah. like a like your old Bond. I'm young. My time. Your time is in the past. My time is now, old man. It's like that yeah. kind of a thing. My time where I smartly wear tactical gear while you wear a fucking sweater vest. I'm gonna wear a bulletproof vest <sighs> Jesus. while you wear the sweater from Bullet. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, this is this is like when we talk about Bond girls. This is what I mean by like the Daniel Craig movies. They just never got it right because, at least in um, in the Pierce Brosnan movies, like as good or bad as they were. There was a good synthesis of Bond girl as, like, like, okay, this is going to sound super sexist, but, like, the traditional Bond girl as, like, eye candy, but also as efficient, um, efficient mover of the plot and also self-reliant. Well, like, so they actually did it really well. I guess kind of that, this dovetails with that, with the movie being too hip and self-aware. 
like it's constantly trying to comment on bond as a concept mm-hmm. to the distraction of like the movie itself yeah um you know it's i think it is you could argue part of it is the uh you know bond is a misogynist we need to update it angle where you know if the bond girls didn't work for you in this i think that might be part of like the attempt to update them quote unquote might have fallen flat here i didn't think so i thought all the bond women were very good in this so Um, what i mean by that is like let's like specifically because okay well but let me let me just kind of yeah 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 let list a couple other reasons because i'll bring it back yeah um and then the other thing it's like it it taps in a lot it taps a lot into uh the social discourse around bond and trends in media in general which to, to its detriment i think um so again like we we're getting bashed over the head with the like spies aren't like james bond anymore they're more like this technology and the spy state and it, this movie predicted covid somehow as well yeah. um yeah. with like like a lab uh, an off the books lab leaked a virus to the world and we all have to social distance and shit like that yeah. was way too on the nose um which is weird because this movie was made in 2019 mm-hmm. um so it makes you wonder what did these people know um, what did wade and purvis really know they're, they're they must be lizard people um, <laughs> but we're in china uh, visiting <laughs> Uh, so there's that there's the, so it's like kind of this, like continually framing bond is outdated instead of just embracing what he is mm-hmm. and not having to constantly comment on like, well, this is unrealistic. Um, but also just like, you know, the rise of binge TV and lo- like expanded cinematic universes where you have these l- unbearably long story arcs that have these incredibly delayed, often not great payoffs, um, like expanded worlds and universes full of lore to get lost in, um, which is like, no, we don't need that in a Bond movie. You know, this isn't, this isn't a superhero film. This isn't a fantasy universe. This isn't science fiction. This is just spy movie spies yep. doing spy shit gotta gotta fit like who's the bad guy what country is he trying to destabilize stop him the end you yep. know um so i think very, it's like very it, loose serialization if any at all yeah well it's just like it's it, it the movie is like this weird octopus that grabs every trend around james bond every mm-hmm. point of commentary around james bond and tries to integrate it into its um into itself in in a very comprehensive way, but narratively, aesthetically, um, tonally, thematically, and, and I don't think it needs to do that. I don't think it's it works to do that because it it can't do that and also be a Bond movie. And I think those like all these clashing elements kind of make it. They could have been a shiny and chrome. This movie very easily could have been a shiny and chrome, but yeah. it all pulls it down to a witness, at least for me. Yeah, I think. So Bond, to a degree, has always kind of been about um, testing the norms. Like, I mean, even with... um, The one that comes to mind is Moonraker, because, like, everything was going out into space, and they're like, we need to do that, too. Um, So that's that's where I will say, like, Bond has... The Bond movies have always kind of drawn from what's going on in normal society, or uh, 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 trends. And... My thing about, like, the Bond girl discourse is just, like, a complete misread on what they're doing. I think, like, everyone has this idea of Bond girls as they're just sex objects that pull a switch. And it's, like, that's how it was in the 60s and and in the 70s it, you know, changed a little bit. And they've been changing more and more. I think Timothy Dalton got more involvement from them. And then Pierce Brosnan was just banging everyone he could see in those movies. Like, it was insane. Oh, my God. But... A lot, but like the 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 top build cast members on that, like um, like in Tomorrow Never Dies, Terry Hatcher was pivotal to the plot, 
and Michelle Yeoh just kicked a, a whole lot of ass. Yeah. Um, die well, another that's the day. Thing. People... It's like they were aware of the Bond girl problem way back then. Yeah. And they, they kind of tried to fix it in a very 90s way where it's like all the Bond girls know martial arts and beat people up. Right. Um, which is but fine. I... Oh, go ahead. Well, they synthesized, they synthesized like the sexy Bond girl and the efficient Bond girl. Whereas like with the Daniel Craig movies, you can make a hard divide and just push them across. Like there are there are women who have one scene that Bond fucks, and then there's the actual significant female character that Bond has a platonic at best relationship, maybe flirting, which is weirdly with. Judy Dench in Skyfall. Yeah, um, Ju- Judy Dench is the Bond girl in Skyfall. Like what? What? It's weird. <laughs> like uh, it, it's it's just it's not weird because it's like gross. It's just like a very strange turn that it took. Or like Madeline's, and it and it got to the point where it's like every single Bond girl. He had to just be head over heels in love with. Because, like, Vesperlin, oh, he's in love with her. Madeline Swan, for some reason, oh, he's Yeah, I still in love don't with her, totally like, get I know. why he's in love with her. Um, or, like, why she's different from all the other, like, beautiful women that he interacts with. <laughs> because um, her father killed like, his yeah. lover. Well, what's weird is, like, yeah. you could almost... You, <laughs> this would fuck up my idea for the Bond, the the proper no time to die, but like <laughs> you could almost have a romantic tension between uh, uh, Lashana Lynch and James Bond, you know? Yeah. Where it's like, yeah. like you know, they're they're rivals, but their competition like turns into like this sort of flirty mutual respect or something. Um, right. Yeah, where it's kind of like his interactions with Money Penny in uh, in Skyfall. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought they would go that route. I'm fine that they didn't. And again, a lot of the problems I have with the Daniel Craig Bond girls are a non-issue in No Time to Die, which again is a very non-James Bond James Bond movie because there's no reason for him to be you know hitting up every single girl in this movie. He's like you know five steps away from being married at any given time in this movie. He yeah. already has the woman he loves. And so a lot of his interactions are refreshing instead yeah, of like... I thought, like, because I yeah. thought this movie handled the female characters very well. And I thought like... Yeah, it did. It did. It's, it's one of the weird... It, it's, it's maybe, I think, the one, um, you know, uh, aspect of the movie that counters my argument where like all this talk about Bond and misogyny and the women in his movies, that's a really popular thing that this movie latched onto and tried to integrate in some way. Mm-hmm. And for the most part, it it almost doesn't try to do anything about it. It just has really well written female characters. Um, yeah. What I was, I was gonna I was gonna say one thing. Oh yeah, outside of the opening, which takes place five years before the movie proper, uh, Bond doesn't get laid at all. Yeah. So I was thinking when he blows up at the end, I'm just like, what zero pussy does to a motherfucker. (laughs) (laughs) I thought you were just going to say like, um, like uh, when the bomb goes off instead of like his, his body exploding, it's just like a bunch of cum that goes everywhere. That's all he had left. No time to come. Oh man. Uh, I mean, I guess you could argue that he gets laid at Madeline's house towards the middle, but like, I don't think they're doing it with a, like a kid there and that kind of architecture where there's like no doors. So yeah. there's like no fucking privacy or anything. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, I just thought it was really weird because they've been trying so hard to like nail Bond girl. <laughs> yeah. That expression. Um, and it's just like, it's like all of Daniel Craig's movies, it was either they're just you know, material to have sex with or they're significant to the plot. And it's like, por que no los dos, you know? Women like to be... Women like sex too. That's all I'm saying. I don't know. <sighs> Feminists out there, go ahead and tear me apart. I don't... I, Remember I don't when know. he snuck up and had sex with like a, a rape victim in Skyfall? Mm-hmm. That was weird. Yep. Like compare that. <laughs> of compare all the ways that to, to mishandle things. I know. I that's that's like <laughs> like that's when you're trying. Like you're in the era now where you're like trying to be self-aware, and then that's what you do. <laughs> yeah, it's just like you know what they handled Christmas Jones better. All right, oh. God. Uh, the one thing I do miss is like 
the outrageously salacious names of a lot of the Bond girls. Hey, Quantum of Solace had Strawberry Fields. Not that they ever said it out loud. It's yep. just how she's credited. Poor Gemma but they Arterton. Could, they, they could bring that back. Like, can yeah, you imagine yeah. if, <laughs> if like, like a very serious, like, non-romantic character like the new 007 was called, like, Octopussy or something? <laughs> 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 or, no, Bond's wife, like, he's like, I'm in love. I'm ready to give up the spy life and all that. It's like, for who? Honey Rider. It's like, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> For pussy galore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like it'd be hard to do now. Like, not not because, not because like, you know, it'd be hard to to come up with. Well, that's why. Because it'd be hard to come up with a name because Ian Fleming already did all of them. Yeah. Well, it's also just it's hard to, speaking. like, put that name in one of these movies and not have the audience just roll their eyes, you know? Yeah. I, mean, I think it would I, be funny, though. I think that's part of the... Ch- but see, that's part of the charm of, of James Bond movies. Like, that's part of the charm. Um, I know I've mentioned this before, but um, Brandon Sanderson, the author, has this idea of the iconic character. And nowadays, we're so obsessed with all characters having a story arc. And sometimes you just want to go and see a movie where a guy just is that iconic personality. And the one that he goes to is James Bond. He's just an iconic personality. Well, what's interesting and he is he doesn't there's... need to evolve. And yeah. you just want to see him go on an adventure like Indiana Jones goes on adventures. You don't need to have character development necessarily. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like there's there's generally two kinds of character arcs where it's like a character is one way, the way they are is tested by the story, and then they change because they realize they were wrong in some respect or Mm -hmm. the character is one way they're tested by the story and then they don't change because they were right all along and the world (laughs) needed to realize it. Um, That second arc is generally absent from most media these days. Yeah. Um, It's kind of like James Bond in some respects is kind of the last bastion of that where it's like, he is constantly being tested by the world around him, saying that he is, you know, a fossil, needs to be done away with, has no place in the world as it is now. Um, And then it's like, no, actually, me running around and shooting people is still necessary. Um, But even then, it's like, eh, he doesn't even need that kind of an arc, you know? It just needs to be like, hey, Bond, there's a problem. Can you fix it? Yes, I can. That's the thing. That's why he... like. It's the same with Superman. We don't need Superman to have some sort of tragic character arc. We just need Superman to stop bad guys from doing crazy things. Like the character who is changing is the bad guy, I guess. And we just want to watch Superman do crazy shit. Like, it's fine. It, well, yeah, people, I mean, there's there's fine. certain kind of stories where you can, you can say something very profound without the character, the main character going through any kind of an arc at all, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, because the whole thing with Superman is that, like, he represents an idea and he changes the world around him by being that idea. Yeah. So it's like, you can say a lot with that. You don't have to have Superman constantly in conflict with himself. Um, All right. Um, By the way, the theme song, did you like it? Billie Eilish's No Time to Die. Nope. Neither did I. I didn't remember it at all. I listened to it again, and I was like, yep, that's why I don't remember it. I mean, part uh, of the, one of the reasons why Casino Royale is the best Bond movie is because uh, You Know My Name is probably so the best awesome. Bond theme song. Um, and it has also probably the best opening credits. Um, yeah. Well, we didn't go into it, but like, because, you know, remember when Daniel Craig started off, everyone was pissed. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah, I remember. We were, Everyone's like, he's we blonde a hair. He can't be Bond. Yeah, he doesn't know how to drive stick shift. He doesn't smoke cigarettes anymore. He's not Bond. What, next he's going to not drink? Look at his ears. What? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, like, that opening scene was like, Martin Campbell was like, okay, we need to reintroduce Bond, and we need to introduce him in a way that people will like and he just concentrated all of his effort 
on reintroducing him to the point where he's like, we're going to take the opening gun barrel scene and put it at the very end to show you you're in good hands. You will like him as Bond. This will be excellent and you'll enjoy it. And like, it's amazing how powerful the opening to Casino Royale is. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. that, if you ever are, if, if you listener out there, if you ever want to write an opening scene or introduce a character, everyone always talks about introducing Indiana Jones as Harrison Ford. Rewatch Casino Royale's opening. Like it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it leads into one of the best songs with You Know My Name. It's like, it keeps, You Know My Name keeps playing in my head when I try to think of other Bond theme songs. I know, exactly. I'm trying to think of like, what's another good one? And it's like, um, I try I, to remember how Tom Jones yeah. sounds for Thunderball. And it, my mind immediately just switches to You Know My Name. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I I actually like Skyfall. I think that's a pretty good song. Um uh, Skyfall's a weird my brother, one because uh, yeah, that it shouldn't year, work, but it does. Well, it shouldn't. It's it's decent, but it's like that year. Muse came out with an album where the first song is literally a James Bond theme song. Really? Yeah. And from what I remember, the lyrics like sounded weirdly relevant <laughs> to the plot of Skyfall. And this came out like a little while. This came out before Adele was announced as the, um, you know, the the singer for the Skyfall theme. Oh, so no matter what, you were you were gonna hate it because you were like, ah, but Muse. So yeah, I was like, I was going to this is like, is Muse, like, because there was some rumors about them going to do the song for Skyfall. Um, you know, they were, this was like at the peak of their popularity. I mean, they were, mm -hmm. you know, in, in an era where rock and roll music is kind of dying, um, yeah. they were probably one of the top rock acts out there. Um, so they were a big deal, especially like, you know, in their home country of England. Um, mm. jolly old. So it was like, it's like, it, it just all seemed to be kind of lining up where it's like, oh, okay, they're going to announce Muse. It's e they're either just going to use this song that's on their latest album or they're, they'll record something very similar. Um, and then they announced Adele, and I was just like, what? And then it's like, you know, she does the, the, the Adele, you know, her usual Adele thing, which is like, I think part of the issue that I have with a lot of the more recent Bond theme songs, you know, I didn't like the Jack White, Alicia Keys one either, yeah. just because <gasps> it, it was, it, so it's just bad. bad. Um, so bad. But... You know, a lot of, of the movie, it's a lot of contemporary pop music, and I've complained about I complained about this on the uh, Old Guard podcast. A lot of contemporary music is like this mopey, downbeat bullshit where it's like someone just kind of drones over a very minimalist beat with very minimal backing, and it's like we have three like sad core droning Bond songs in a row. You know, like Skyfall, yep. whatever Sam Smith did and mm -hmm. whatever Billie Eilish did for this one, they all just bleed together in my mind. I mean, they're, I can't tell them apart. They're all yeah. kind of have the same feeling to them. And they all kind of, they all just kind of fit that same mold of like, and it's like, you know, just get, yeah, jazz it up a little bit. Let's, let's liven it up. Cause like, I think my second favorite Bond song you know, if I was to think about it, it's probably View to a Kill. Um, I mean, I thought Duran Duran just nailed that one. But again, it's like... I haven't heard that one in... Yeah, I haven't heard that one in forever. It's like... But it, it's like lively to it, you know? It's like it's not just this droning, amorphous uh, mess. Yeah. I mean, like Live and Let Die stands out to me. Goldfinger, because I've heard it so many times. Um, like, I... Yeah, you're... But... There have been a lot, like, the Bond theme songs are all over the map. Diamonds Are Forever is also kind of slow. But, like, I I know what you mean. Like, the only reason that Skyfall sticks out and is decent to me is because Adele does hit those, like, powerful notes. Where, like, Billie Eilish doesn't really do that. Well, I think and... it's also, like, before, before Adele's style of music became, became the mainstream. predominant style. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was still like Adele was still kind of new at the time. I mean, she was big. She was a big deal. Yeah, she was huge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it wasn't 2012. like yeah. like a you know a, a a a powerful vocalist singing slowly over basically nothing. 
was still kind of a novel concept, I think. Yeah. Well, so the other thing is Skyfall is that the opening credit scene, like this is why to me Skyfall is great, is like Sam Mendes had a clear vision for every single aspect of that movie. And the opening scene, he was like, I want it to be like James Bond is falling the entire time. And the opening scene feel, or the, not the opening scene, the credits, it feels like it had a very strong visual vision that, you know, brought it forward. Like the camera's either always pushing in or something's always falling down. It feels effective. Um, mm. I will say that one reason I think, um, you know, my name is so good is because David Arnold, who scored every Bond movie from uh, Tomorrow Never Dies till Quantum of Solace worked with Chris Cornell in the music like he was one of the producers mm. so it still has those bond chords in there whereas like you know the Jack White one doesn't um a lot of the other like Skyfall I guess it kind of does but they'd switched composers to Thomas Newman by then yeah. and I know that they brought Hans Zimmer in to do No Time to Die but I really wish they had just reached out to to David Arnold to do it cuz like his bond scores are yeah, everyone loves the John Barry stuff, but like to me, I love David Arnold's scores. Mm -hmm. There, I thought he always did such a good job. You know, he established good themes, and he just had that stuff. Like he, because I grew up with those movies, he has the Bond, like the '90s Bond style. Yeah. So I was sad that he didn't come well, back. The other thing because do I don't remember any of the music in this movie. Neither do I. I mean, James Bond movies. You know, it's like Star Wars. There's just certain musical phrases that are associated with yeah. James Bond. Well, usually they'll do variations on a theme, like mm -hmm. the theme song. They, they, uh, they change it slightly here and there so that you're, you know, but, uh, yeah, no, it doesn't happen too often. Now. But yeah, I mean, it's good when, you know, you have whoever's doing the theme song work with the Bond composer to make mm -hmm. sure that like those phrasings are still in the theme song. Yeah. It's, um, I guess if we've learned anything, it's that Casino Royale just can't be beat it's too good it's it like is. floyd I mayweather mean, you just you just can't win <laughs> <laughs> you know what though casino royale didn't have uh m and it didn't or it didn't have a uh, q and it didn't have money penny and i wish they had brought them on in their current state earlier because they're a lot of fun like that's one of the reasons i like skyfall so much that's one of the reasons why specter is a little bit decent and i feel like they're just cri uh cri criminally criminally, criminally? underused yeah like uh, Skyfall used well, but then Inspector and No Time to Die. It's like I wish, I wish, I wish I had more of them in it. And uh, Q's hairless cat, which is a very, a very Q thing. Who yep. is also gay? So you know, kudos. Yeah. But well, I, I figured, more... you know, they they would do that considering the actor and also hmm. kind of the. I, I'm sure he probably advocated for it. Oh yeah, I'm sure they put it in. I apparently the set was. This is going back to Kerry Fukunaga. Apparently the way that they shot the movie was very much like an independent film, probably in the, a lot of the dialogue scenes where they only did a couple of takes and then they moved on. I think mm. there was probably a good amount of like, you have to be on script, but like, let's dance around. Let's improvise a little bit. Let's make sure we're hitting, you know, that we're getting to the essence of each scene character wise, which is why I think it stands so strong as like the one thing everyone says, it's a very character driven movie. I'm like, yeah. And that's why, like, kind the of. villains, well, uh, but, like, the villains, the villains' motivation isn't as important, quote, unquote, isn't as important, unquote, because the thing that's carrying you on is, like, I like Bond. I like this character. I like that character. Wait, I want to see But what isn't happens. a villain's motivation part of his character? I mean, yeah, this is why, and, I mean, this is why Lucifer fails every single time. It's just, like, uh, what a waste. I know. Like it, he had, God, he, and Rami Malek. He so could have been a contender. He had potential. Uh, <laughs> just yeah, it's 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 disappointing. I it also might just be that like Neil Purvis and Robert Wade just can't write good villains anymore because like like Silva is a pretty good villain, but he I, I don't know. I I know everyone loves him, but like he he flirts with being a good villain. Yeah, all all of them do. Like. Ernst oh, Stavro dude. Blofeld is Le a blowhard because a, of his backstory, villain. not because of Christoph Waltz. I actually thought Le Chiffre was so annoying when I first saw Casino <laughs> Royale, but now that I love Mads Mikkelsen, I'm like, 
He should have been in more. Uh, he's he perfect. Been in it more. He's a perfect love, Bond oh God, villain. So he's fun. the right mix of like. I don't know. He's he's the perfect he... villain for that movie because it's like he's not the evil mastermind. He's he's mm-hmm. actually quite desperate. Yeah. But he's still like very cool for most of it. And he yeah. you know, he always gets his way until the very end. Oh god. But watching it again, dude, those poker scenes are so cringy. Oh god. Also, <laughs> also, and I've said it before, I will say it every single time, Bond winning on a straight flush is great. Bond winning on a royal flush is Bond. Like he should have won on a royal flush. You could have made it work, movie. You could have made it work. <laughs> um okay so we should wrap up soon but first who do you think the next bond should be if you need a list of candidates michael fassbender bring it out Ooh, i've said this like every time this question comes up i've said michael fassbender for the last like god whenever since whenever specter came out um he's always been my pick like everyone's like idris elba would make a great bond i'm like yes he would make a great Bond 20 years 10 ago. 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's how I feel. Although, Kerry Fukunaga has gone on record and said, yeah, Idris Elba would be a good Bond. It's like, yeah, no shit. We all know it. We all he know has, he would be. He's just... He he's would have gray been. Hair. He would have been. He would have made a great Bond <coughs> 20 years ago. Oh, that's, um, the, that's... Yeah. But again, Daniel Craig, to me, made a great Bond. So it's like, you know, what were you going to do? So I get it. Um, Michael Fassbender, huh? He's... He's not really talked about as far as I know anymore. Let's see. How For reasons he? unknown. Well, as far as Bond goes. Well, or just in general. Yeah, he's getting up there in age. 44. Yeah, he is getting old. Yeah. Well, it's the same with like, you know, for a long time, Tom Hardy was talked about. No, like, he Obviously, he would be good, but I don't know if I'd watch <laughs> to see him. Tom Hardy's like twitchy crackhead Bond. <laughs> the thing is is like (laughs) with his pinky with his right pinky that doesn't unfurl at all i know the thing with tom hardy is like he auditioned he basically auditioned for bond back in 2010 with uh, inception and was fantastic Mm -hmm. like he was basically james bond in that movie and he did an amazing job um but somehow i don't know if he could do it now um I don't think you'd want to. Well, it's, the other thing is like Christopher Nolan's really good at getting Bond auditions out of people. Like, yeah, he he made Tom Hardy look like the the next James Bond in Inception. He made Bobby Pattinson look like the next James Bond in um, uh, Tenet. Tenet. So who knows? Maybe Christopher Nolan just has to find the next one, and then everyone's like, "Hey, that guy, that guy yeah. should." Be. You know, it, what's weird is um, Daniel Craig got the Bond role off of Lair Cake. Yeah. Um, and now Matthew Vaughn is making spy movies with Taron Egerton, who's just insufferable. I like Taron Egerton. I'm just I I'm really hoping Taron Egerton's not the next James Bond. <laughs> I don't. Think I don't he will want. Be. I don't want uh, uh, Matthew Vaughn to be the kingmaker for James Bond actors. <laughs> I. It's weird to think that James Bo- that uh, Daniel Craig got it off the role of uh, of. Um layer cake i can see it though i I can see it enough yeah yeah because he he in that movie he is very much the type of character that um eon was trying to reinvent bond to be yeah um yeah you know good with the ladies but also like socially conscious i guess i don't know but like he he had like this very hard edge to him in that movie where he's he and he has to survive completely by his wits like he's always outgunned yeah. Um, well, what's also funny is that, like, I think the year before, Daniel Craig was in Munich, which is, like, a spy movie. Mm-hmm. And he's very un-James Bond in that. <laughs> so it's just like, But yeah, okay. back to, like, Fassbender has played some good spy characters. I mean, he was in Glorious Bastards. Um, uh, was it Havoc? Not Havoc. Uh, Haywire. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he was in Haywire, where he has different accents. Mm-hmm. That was fun. Yeah. Who would I, your pick I, be? Uh, my pick is the is a dark horse. I'd go with Alan Leach from uh, from Downton Abbey. If he could fake a British accent, I, don't know I think he'd is. be perfect. Um, let's see. What movies would he be in that you've seen? Probably nothing. Uh, let me see here. But he's the he's um, an Irish actor. He's pretty 
he's pretty generic looking, but I think he's just under the radar enough that like it would be an impressive find because he could do he could do the stunt work. Um and he I don't know, he just looks like a bond to me. But it would either be him. I was trying to think of someone like really, really off the radar. Because, you know, they're they're trying to be like socially conscious and <laughs> stuff like that. And I was thinking like I I don't this is gonna be a weird one. I don't know if it would actually work, but uh I I'm gonna put our, our boy Lakeith Stanfield out there. I don't know if it would work. Daniel though. Kaluuya. I've thought about that too, so but the, I feel like Daniel Kaluuya is too sinister looking all exactly. the time. Exactly. So that's the th- that's the point. Um, he Daniel Kaluuya is very villainous. He would make a perfect Bond because the actors who are tend to be the great Bonds are typically good at playing bad guys. You know, it's like yeah, I guess so. Yeah, Timothy cause... Dalton makes a great villain. Pierce Brosnan yeah, makes a great villain. Daniel Craig makes a great villain. Yeah. Daniel Kaluuya makes a great villain. He could be the next Bond. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I was, yeah. That's. I guess that's a good point. I never thought about it that way. And Mac- Michael Fassbender plays a great villain. So yeah. Yeah. He was. He was the second one. But I was like, I don't know. I think Daniel Kaluuya might be too old. He's not that old. He's like in his early thirties. Oh, holy shit! Yeah. Fuck. Get Daniel Kaluuya to do it. Hell he, oh, damn. he's he's 32. our guy. He's Daniel my... Kaluuya, James there Bond. It is. Let's make it happen. Let's uh, let's get the petition started. I'm all in. <laughs> uh, I'm all in for that, man. Fuck. Uh, Daniel, hear that? Barbara Broccoli and or Michael G. Wilson. Wilson, right? It's Michael Wilson, right? I don't know. Yeah. Um, although I think he's done because he's 79 and I don't think he's going to produce another one of these things. But uh, Broccoli, yeah, cauliflower, it... all the vegetables. Get get Daniel Kaluuya <laughs> to, <laughs> to play James Bond. He's the Official guy. Official petition. And hey... If you guys want him to play James Bond, um, let us know in the comments down below so that we can get a pa- Patreon going so we can fund the campaign to get Daniel Kaluuya to be the the next James Bond. I think like I think that's good. It's off it's like off the radar enough. The only thing is like I think he might be a little too famous cuz they kind of like to get people who aren't super famous. I don't know, maybe... man. I think he I think he checks all the boxes. Like he checks all the, oh, the social awareness boxes that the studio is trying to hit. He also, I think, checks the character boxes. Like he's the right age. He's good at being bad. Like, God damn, I didn't know he was that young. Shit. Yeah, man. It's fuck. He's, it's it. I think we got it. I, I think, think we've we solved. We've solved Eon Productions' biggest problem. Oh my god, dude! If we, uh, if he, if he's announced like in two years, if they announce that Daniel Kaluuya is the new James Bond, we're gonna look back at this and be like. They either listen to this or we predicted the future. I don't think it's going to happen, but my God, I want it to happen. <laughs> That'd be so awesome, dude. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, anything else to say on Bond or anything like that? <sighs> Not really. It's just no time to die. There's so much going on that shouldn't be. I wish it was simpler. And that would, would have made it better. Would you want to rewatch it? No. No. I don't have three hours. <laughs> I don't have three hours to watch a Bond movie. Get the get the Blu-ray of it. Just cut out all of the frivolous scenes. Re-edit it and, and, yeah, exactly. and just do my best Rami Malek impression for because <laughs> I want him to be in the movie more. He's I thought he was yeah. great. Yeah. It's yeah. It also it's speaking of like Rami Malek the Blade Runner 2049 and Jared Leto, like um, in that one movie, I think it's the little things with Denzel Washington, Rami Malek and Jared Leto. Rami Malek literally kills Jared Leto in the movie. And uh, yeah, I just like to think that he killed him and took over his hideout in Blade Runner 2049. (laughs) Just like um, uh, Liam Neeson was supposed to play Lincoln for Steven Spielberg. And then uh, um, Daniel Day Lewis killed Liam Neeson in gangs of New York through a knife in, the face of Abraham Lincoln and then played Lincoln. Wait, Liam Neeson maybe. was going to play Lincoln. That sounds terrible. This was uh way, this was like, because Lincoln with while, an Irish accent. <laughs> <laughs> Cause he can't do an American well, accent to save his life. Well, it, it would have been like, um, um, like, you know how we always think of Abraham Lincoln as, uh, this having this really strong imposing voice. So I can see Liam Neeson being like four score and seven years ago. 
Like I could, I could see, and he has the height, Four and he's got the nose. And seven years ago, yeah, like this I country, could, this like, country, whoa. like that doesn't sound American at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I could, I could see it in like the late '90s, mm, yeah. even early 2000s. Um, but you know, the, I, then again, I, I wouldn't have told you that I could see. Uh, yeah, it is kind of weird because Lincoln is like this sickly old man. And you're going to get like Liam Neeson, who's like six feet tall and like really, well, you I know, mean, Lincoln really strong foundation for his time. Like he's like six, four. Oh, okay. Like Lincoln was a massive movie, man, but he just had a movie, very he high. He like a 90 voice. year old. Like in the, like in your day, Lewis is always well, hunched over so wearing the a whole, blanket. B- like, oh. Based on historical documents available to us, Abraham Lincoln was extremely tall um, mm-hmm. and had a very high pitched and kind of weak sounding voice that didn't project very far yeah and Extreme. it was he was advised to grow out a beard to make himself appear more masculine yep i knew about that well i i thought it was just like someone wrote a letter the you know the story goes which lincoln liked to tell a lot of stories so but that someone had written in and said oh you know my mom likes beards and women like beards so grow out a beard and he was like i will get the female vote but i don't did women have voting power then i don't know they did they couldn't vote until like 1918 1920 thereabouts 1960 (laughs) uh so they just like they're they just withheld sex from their husbands until until they voted for lincoln (laughs) uh anyway um if they if people were interested in our backlog of episodes, where can they go, Gabe? We're on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher. Uh, our YouTube channel is just Under the Wheels. You can reach out to us at video at underthewheels.com. Like us on Facebook and various other social media platforms. Underthewheels.com is our Podcasts. website where we post all kinds of cool shit, um, which you should definitely check out. Yeah. Like, leave a review, comment wherever you can, and uh, yeah. And remember, Daniel Kaluuya for James Bond. Yes. It's our campaign. It's the mountain we're going to die on. (laughs) Other people, politics. Us, Daniel Kaluuya for James Bond. Some people would say that's political. I guess so. I mean, it, 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 yeah, yeah. Those are the same people who are like, well, we hired him because he's the best person for the role. It's like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Stop using that excuse. Speaking of which, Denzel Washington as Macbeth. Very exciting. Shot in uh, 4x3. Too bad it's on Apple TV+, Plus, which I don't have and never will. They are going to release it in theaters. Nice. Probably for... Then I will watch it. (laughs) Yes. Yes. That would be the... Hey, uh, you know, if you like the show, let us know so we can start a, um, a Patreon so we can have a... A uh, commun- uh, uh, corporate account for Apple Plus TV, so we could catch up on all those <laughs> Apple TV Plus programs that oh, everyone nice. is talking about, but no one's watching. Like, um, Greyhound with yeah, Tom Hanks. Like, is the only the one I can ever think Tom of. Tom Hanks wrote. Tom Hanks is a writer now. He uh, he also wrote and directed that thing you do. So yeah. His- Maybe not a good writer. One on that uh, note. Yes. <laughs> on that note, I'm Matthew. And I'm Gabe. And you have just been under the wheels. I wanted to do something clever with no time to die or like we had time to kill. We have no time to kill. Ah, we had all the time in the world and we really used it. I Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> this podcast is way too long. <laughs> oh, this will be fun. This will be fun. I'll get it out in like four weeks. No, I'm just kidding. Finished.